Okay. Instructions are directions given to a computer. And the little Martian computer has nine of them. And yes, you can actually do useful stuff with nine instructions. It only has one data type, the 12-bit twos complement integer, and we would really need more than that. Um, those directions cause electrical signals to be generated. Now, I sort of hummed the part of the control unit when we talked about let's build a computer on Tuesday. Um, but if you think back to that adder, can I build a 3-bit counter by having a 3-bit adder and just do add 1, add 1, add 1, add 1? Sure. So that part of it, the, the, the cycle counter, is something that we've already delved into a little bit. Can I build out of digital logic gates something that takes 28 signals in and generates the signals out necessary to drive the data path? Sure. We, we skipped over it because it's an abstract detail. But at this point in the class, you should be convinced that if we had to design that, we could. And if you were in a computer science class, we would. Okay, the instruction set of a computer is the whole collection of instructions that it can perform. So the little Martian computer has nine instructions on that first slide that we looked at. The instruction set defines everything that a particular processor can do. And I said particular processor because different families of computers have different instruction sets. Um, for a long time, um, actually, the Mac computer started out with a Motorola chip in there. And then for a long time, there was an Intel x86 chip in Macs. And now um, Apple has started making their own chips. Those three chips had different instruction sets. And in fact, Apple gave up and essentially made uh, Mac OS out of Linux at some point a few years ago put a, a different shell on it. The instruction set differentiates different computer architectures by the number of instructions, the complexity, the data types, and a minute ago I kind of whined and said um, TBC only supports one data type, a 12-bit two's complement number. If we were doing a real computer, we'd have to figure out a way to encode characters in there as well. The layout of the instruction is part of the computer architecture and the number of registers and how they're used. The addressing mode is part of the computer architecture. The different, different designs, different instruction sets. And the design dictates the instruction set and defines what that, what a particular CPU family can do. Okay. The, an instruction has an operation code, an op code, that tells the control unit and the ALU what to do. And we saw that the op code is a single digit with TBC and LMC. The operands, and there can be more than one, although we have only one operand in our tiny binary computer, tell the location of the data. The source operand says where to get the data, and that's all we've got is a source operand. Um, actually, that's not true. Um, the source operand tells us where to get the data. The result operand tells us where to put the result. And that one can also be called the destination operand. Those operands are usually addresses. They might be register addresses or they might be addresses in main memory. So the addresses could be explicit or implicit. There's an example of an instruction with an operation code 3 and an operand 25. In this case, the operand is an address. An explicit address is encoded in the instruction, so it's the 25 there. Implicit is implied by the nature of the instruction. Um, so TBC 
uh, both load and store, also add and subtract, use the accumulator. And that is an implicit address. Addresses may refer to either memory or registers. We've only got one data register in TBC, the accumulator, so we can refer to it implicitly. So in general, for real computers, there would be an operation code, usually shortened to opcode, and a source operand and a result operand. More specifically, some computer, and this is a hypothetical one, might have an 8-bit operation code. So how many different instructions can that computer have? 256. Thank you. 256 because... You, you said it right in the first couple of words you said, two to the eighth. Two to the eighth power, right. We can have an operation code zero. And in fact, the halt instruction in LMC and TBC is opcode zero. And then we have a register operand, four bits. How many registers does this computer have? If an eight bit opcode gives us two to the eighth operations, and a 4-bit register operand gives us how many registers? Yes. Hmm? 16, because 2 to the 4th is 16. Are you beginning to understand why all that binary stuff is important? We have to start using it before it starts making sense. But if you don't know it, once again, you can be baffled. And I've got 20 bits of a memory operand. How big, assuming we don't do any address arithmetic, how big of memory can this computer have? One million, exactly. Uh, well, approximately a million, because 2 to the 20th is about a million. It's a million 73,000 and something, I think, but about a million. So this computer can have a megabyte, assuming it's byte addressed, a megabyte of memory. And no more, unless we do something with address arithmetic. Okay, the formats of instructions, and I just showed you a hypothetical general format and then an even more hypothetical specific format. The formats are particular to a family of computers, which we will call an architecture. So the x86 architecture, the 32-bit architecture from Intel, and the x64 architecture, the current 64-bit architecture, um, are families of computers. Um, Apple's new silicon for the new Macs is a different family with a different architecture, and so different instruction formats. The instruction format defines, the slide says specifies, but it defines the length of the operation code. And the length of the operation code limits how many different instructions we can have. With a 4-bit operation code, TBC can have no more than 16 instructions. That's all we can do. The instruction format tells us how many operand fields and how big they are. And because these things can be severely limiting. We just looked at some limitations of one. A single computer might have several different instruction formats. Okay, categories of instructions. Data transfer, move it from here to there like load and store. Arithmetic, like add and sub. Logical operations, TBC doesn't have any. If you want to compare two numbers, you have to subtract them and see if they're zero. Program control, we got three of those. We have the unconditional branch, the branch always, um, branch on positive and branch on zero. Real program, real, real computers have more program control instructions than those three. Stack manipulation. Um, there's a hypothetical stack function for TBC that's described in the appendix of the textbook but it's not implemented in the one that's online yet. Input, output, and machine control. Multiple data instructions, and we'll see an example of that in a minute. Data transfer instructions move data between registers in the CPU. 
transfer data to and from memory. Um, and generally, the transfer size is the word size. So with a 64-bit Intel computer, when we transfer data, we're going to transfer 64 bits. The Intel 8008 was an 8-bit computer. Uh, the Motorola chips in the early Macs were 16 bits. Um, we all re are able to remember 32-bit computers and now 64 bits. And in some of the Spark designs or MIPS designs, 128 bits. 64 bits, that's what's common. Arithmetic instructions, the usual concepts are add, subtract, divide, and multiply. Uh, TBC has only add and subtract. If you wanted to multiply, you'd have to do it by repeated addition with a loop. You can do it, but you'd have to have to do it by repeated addition. And if you wanted to divide, you have to do that by repeated subtraction. Generally, there will be separate instructions for integer operands and floating point operands. Remember, the integers are likely to be two's complement binary numbers. Um, and really, it's, they're almost guaranteed to be two's complement binary numbers. The floating point uh, operands are going to be IEEE 754 opera, uh, numbers and probably in the double precision or 64-bit format. So they, they look very different. And that means we need different instructions for integers and floating points. Shift and rotate instructions belong in arithmetic. I can shift left to multiply by 2 or shift right to divide by 2. There's also a rotate that is sometimes good for something. Bits shifted out of one end are, are used as the replacement bit at the other end. And then we have things like increment and complement. Logical operations, the AND and OR, sometimes XOR, NOR, NOT, comparison, greater than, less than, or equal, um, testing for zero, positive, or negative. TBC only has testing for zero or positive, but you can test for negative by testing for positive and, and essentially taking the opposite direction. You have, po have not positive, if you will. Um, the branch instruction simply shoves an address into the program counter. Remember, the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. And if in the execute phase of an instruction, I shove a new value into the program counter, when we come back up and do fetch, I'm going to fetch from that new location. Call instructions have to save the program counter someplace because we want to be able to return. I want to call a procedure, and then I want to be able to get back to where I started from. So as, as I said a minute ago, branching someplace is no trouble at all. We just shove a new value into the program counter. If we, if we want to do a procedure call, we have the same problem that Hansel and Gretel had. Everybody knows the fairy tale, right? Getting there was no trouble. Getting back was a problem. Um, so we have to store the program counter someplace when we do a procedure call. Now, the problem that we face is often one procedure needs to call another procedure in high-level language programming, right? And that second call, the oops there, the oops says the original calling address was overwritten. Um, if there's only one place to save the program counter, we can't have nested procedures. That is, we can't allow one procedure to call another procedure. So, we have to solve that problem of subroutine linkage. One way to do it, and, and the way that modern computers do, is with dynamic allocation, so that I can save as many return addresses as I need. 
And the way we do that is with a last in first out data structure so that the return address is that of the most recent procedure call. In computer terms, we call that a stack. Let's see an example of that. Machines with stacks have push and pop instructions. Push places a value which could come from the program counter on top of the stack and if necessary moves everything else down, like placing a tray on that stack of trays in the cafeteria. Pop removes the item at the top of the stack and moves the others up. When you take the top tray from that stack, you get the one most recently placed on top. The one below that becomes the new top. Push and pop can be used to save and restore data, but they're most useful with subprogram linkage. When the main program encounters call A, the program counter, which holds the address of the next instruction, is pushed onto the stack. Then the address of method A is loaded into the program counter. After the call instruction, the top of the stack is the address of the next instruction in the main program. Because the address of method A was loaded into the program counter after saving the return address on the stack, method A runs. It contains a call to method B. When method A calls method B, the program counter, which contains the address of the next instruction, in this case 2050, is pushed onto the stack. The address 2050 is now at the top of the stack, and the others have moved down. After the program counter has been saved on the stack, the address of method B is stored in the program counter register so that the next instruction will be the first instruction of method B. Method B runs. It doesn't contain any calls, although it could. It does contain a return instruction. Let's look at how that works. The return instruction in method B pops the return address from the top of the stack and puts it in the program counter register. It is the address in method A immediately after the call B instruction, so method A continues at the point right after the call instruction. The return instruction in method A works the same way. The address at the top of the stack is now 1027. It is popped off the stack and stored in the program counter. At the beginning of the next instruction cycle, the instruction immediately after call A in the main program will be executed. The I.O. and machine control um, instructions move data to and from I.O. devices. We'll talk about direct memory access I.O. a little bit later. Machine state switching, we're going to talk about privileged instructions a little bit later. Um, we can't do it all in one class. It would kill me and wouldn't make you happy either. Interrupt control, we'll talk about interrupts a little later. And state saving, save the whole state of a program so that another program can run. And the halt instruction. Real computers often have halt instructions, but they're never used because we want the computer to keep running, right? Multiple data instructions. This, this is um, the highly parallel stuff. Same operation on multiple data items. So we can do vector processing and array processing. Um, this happens a lot in graphics processing. It happens a lot in artificial intelligence and large language models. The most prevalent kind of multiple data instruction is the so-called SIMD, um, single instruction multiple data. And it looks like this. If I have a register that is some number of bits long, but it's divided into, let's say that it's 32 bits long, but it's divided into four 8-bit values. Well, guess what? If I'm doing that red, green, blue color model, and I have an alpha channel, I might store four 8-bit values in a 32-bit word, huh? And I might want to do arithmetic on them. In the multiple data instructions, instead of adding the two 32-bit words together, which we can't do, we'll have carries from red into green and otherwise mess things up if we simply add the two numbers. What we have to do is add pairs of bytes together. 
is shown in that diagram. And that, that is what I mean when I say single instruction, multiple data. In the memory capacity of a computer, um, this one has, man, this has eight gigabytes of memory in it, which our first computer I ever did anything with had 4K bytes. Two factors, the size of that memory address register. Remember, the memory address register holds the address to be read or written. And if I have a k-bit address, I can have two to the k power cells. It's also limited by the size of the effective address part of an instruction. And often we're going to do some address arithmetic. Um, to give you one example, the IBM mainframe instruction set has 12-bit addresses. Well, that'll only address 4,096 bytes of memory, right? But that 12-bit address is added to um, formerly 32 bits, now 64-bit base register. And now I can go anywhere, anywhere in, in a huge hunk of memory, but I'm limited to 4,096 bytes at a time. I can do this 4K and then this one and then this one and address all of memory if I need to. The amount of physical memory is important for performance. More physical memory means less. We'll talk briefly about virtual memory this morning and then more about it a little later. More physical memory means less I.O., less, less trying to simulate memory and improves performance. The memory address register sends its contents to an address decoder. The address decoder selects one of some number of memory cells. In this case, we're selecting address 003, and that is one byte individual memory cells. You can think of them as latches, eight of them, and we're going to select one set of eight latches and put their contents onto the memory data register. Now, I can't really have a 32-bit memory address register going directly into memory because I would need a 32 to 4 billion decoder. And even, even with the tiny little conductor lines on a chip, that is not a practical thing. But if I divide that 32-bit address into 16 bits of row and 16 bits of column, now I have a 2 to the 16th, 65-536 row addresses and 65-536 column addresses. I can get bigger memories with a bigger, say, a 36-bit memory address register and 18 bits of row and column. If I have large memories, decoding is going to be slow. There's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Decoding happens within the memory chips. Um, if it happened in the CPU, the memory address bus would have to be huge. It'd have to be a four billion or more lines of memory address bus. Two kinds of memory technology, volatile and non-volatile. Volatile memories lose their contents when power is turned off. That is often why powering something off and back on fixes things. It clears out the memory. Non-volatile memories keep their contents even when they're powered off. So your, the flash drive on your key ring is non-volatile. The uh, solid state disk in this laptop is non-volatile. The so-called RAM random access memory is called random access because the slide says any cell may be addressed as fast as any other. It should really say about as fast. Um, there are penalties to switching row and switching column, but about as fast. Dynamic RAM, this is volatile memory. It loses its contents when the power is removed, and it has to be refreshed. Um, a 
maybe a thousand times a second. Um, instead of using transistors to make latches, dynamic RAM stores a charge, a capacitor-like charge. Static RAM does use latches. Um, it's more expensive, it's faster because I don't need a refresh cycle, and it's still volatile. There is something called a synchronous dynamic RAM, and this allows us to put some buffers in there and speed things up, but at the penalty of making the memory run synchronous with some clock. It doesn't have to be the same clock as the CPU clock. Flash memory, non-volatile semiconductor memory, faster than a magnetic disk, not faster than a speeding bullet. Um, we use it in the BIOS or boot memory of a computer in solid state drives, in those keychain drives, in digital cameras, all kinds of stuff that we can carry around with us. Slower than random access memory. And here's an important thing to remember, a limited number of write cycles. It's a pretty large number, but it is a limited number of write cycles. Your Solid state disk has a uh, statistics or status program supplied by the disk manufacturer. If it's a Samsung solid state disk, it's the Samsung Magician. It'll tell you how many writes have been applied and whether you are getting into the danger area. Read only memory is non volatile, it's used to hold software that shouldn't change over the life of the system. Your microwave ovens programming is in read-only memory. Nobody expects to change the microwave oven programming after it goes out of the factory. In pure read-only memory, the contents get defined when the chip is manufactured and then we're done. There is something called electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. It's not as flexible as flash memory, but it can be changed. So we use it when we have infrequent changes. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor memory, CMOS memory, is very low power memory. Um, inside your computer somewhere, there is one of those coin cell batteries. And that coin cell battery is keeping the CMOS memory that's holding the clock information so that when you turn your computer back on, the clock is right. Um, I already said all that. Modern computers, all modern general purpose digital computers, have byte addressable memory. That is, I can address any 8-bit character, even though I'm probably transferring 64-bit words. Transfer between memory and the CPU happen in words, that's 8 bytes, so if I have a data item that is more than one byte, but less than one word, it should be word aligned in memory so that I need only one memory transfer. If I had eight bits at the end of one 64-bit word and another eight at the beginning of the next 64-bit word, I gotta do two transfers to get those 16 bits. If I can align those 16 bits on a word boundary, only one transfer is needed. Compilers do that for you automagically. And that means the compiler will consume a little bit more data memory than your data would actually suggest was needed. All right, this one's gonna make your hair hurt. Um, depending on the computer architecture, the most significant byte of a word can be stored at the lowest byte address or at the highest byte address. And that decision is made when the architecture is designed. Um, those that are stored at the lowest address are called big endian. Those stored at the highest address are called little endian. Um, because the little end comes first if the big end is stored at the highest address. What that means is that if you write out a computer word instead of writing bytes, 
onto a flash drive on a little Indian computer and try to read it on a big Indian computer, it doesn't work. The bytes are reversed. Um, I think when we were talking about Unicode, I told you that there was a magic byte ordering, which I think is hex FFFE that comes at the beginning of Unicode files. If I didn't tell you that, um, I'm telling you now, okay? And no, you don't need to know it for an exam. But that byte order mark lets the receiving computer know whether the bytes in the data coming in have to be exchanged. All right. We can detect errors if to each byte I add one extra bit, which is called a parity bit. And every time I store that byte in memory, I set the extra bit such that the number of one bits is even. Okay, if I happen to have five bits in a byte, I'm going to set the parity bit to a one. If I've got six bits in the byte, I set the parity bit to a zero. So the total number of one bits is even. Each time a byte is read from memory, the hardware can check the number of bits, including the parity bit, to see if it's still even. If it's not, we know that a memory error has occurred. We don't know what ought to be there, but at least we know that something is wrong. Okay? Um, and memory errors can occur. Um, it can be something as simple as we get, we get continuously bombarded by cosmic rays that go right through everything. Um, and they go right through your semiconductor memory and flip a bit. Oops. Uh, so we can at least know that something has, has gone wrong. We don't have to use even parity. We could use odd parity just as well. Using more bits gets us something called an error correcting code. The example on the slide is a Hamming code. And the last thing on this slide says there are other error correcting codes. But I have um, data bits 0, 1, 2, and 3. And I've got parity bits 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I have as many parity bits as I have data bits. Um, D0 is checked by both parity bit P0 and parity bit P1. If, I, if P1 and P0 both show an error, there's only one place the error could be, and that is in data bit D0. Now I can fix it. If I know that a bit is wrong, all I can do is throw up my hands and say something is wrong. If I know which bit is wrong, well, there's only two choices, so I change it from whatever it is to the other choice, and I fixed it. This is very cool. The Hamming code can correct, can detect double bit errors. A double bit error with just parity, two bits are wrong, and that might slip through. It will slip through. Um, and I can correct single bit errors. There are other error correcting codes that are more complex and more powerful than the Hamming code. And so you can buy error correcting memory. Mostly the commodity computers that we use do not have error correcting memory, but server class computers, mainframes and banks, error correcting memory. We talked about buses a little bit. How are we doing for time? We talked about buses a little bit last time. Um, a bus is nothing more than a collection of conductors that transfer data from one location to another. It doesn't always have to be data. Um, we can transfer three different kinds of signals and power or ground. Power and ground are not signals. Okay, I, I should not try to do two things at once. Data addresses control signals. And the USB universal serial bus also provides power and ground, which is why it can power things like flash drives.
What do we use buses for? We can connect the CPU and memory with buses. Um, we can connect I.O. devices like keyboards and screens. We can um, physically package equipment on this thing that's called a backplane or a motherboard picture coming up. Um, the external bus, the one that the CPU is connected to, is called a system bus. And it's an example of a broadcast bus. Everything else connected to it can see the data that's crossing the bus. Hierarchy works like this. The processor bus is on the processor chip. The memory bus, also called the North Bridge, connects the processor to the memory subsystem and sometimes also to the graphics processor. The I.O. bus, or South Bridge, connects I.O. to CPU and also to memory and connects the peripheral cards and their connectors. So here's the picture of the motherboard for those of you who may never have opened up a computer. Um, the CPU is that thing with the yellow sticker in the center and the two horizontal blue thingies are a place to plug in some cards. All right, bus characteristics. A bus has a protocol that is the agreement for how the communication is going to work. It has a throughput specification, that's the data transfer rate in bits. Data width in bits, how many bits can I move at one time, and we'll talk about that some more. Uh, parallel buses get us high throughput because all the bits get transferred simultaneously on, say for an 8-bit bus, 8 conductors. They're expensive, 8 conductors instead of 1. They require more physical space, 8 lines instead of 1. They are subject to electrical interference and have limitations on both speed and length. Now here's the, here's the real kicker with parallel buses. A nanosecond is this long, right? And the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. Okay. If the conductors of a parallel bus, let's say, let's say we're going to transfer 32 bits, they're guaranteed not all to be exactly the same length. Guaranteed. They might be really, really close, but they're not going to be exactly the same length. Therefore, some bits will arrive at the other end sooner than others. That is called bus skew. And as long as they all arrive within one bit time, everything is okay. But if one or another bit exceeds one bit time, we got the wrong data. Suppose I'm transferring eight bits, okay, and one of them is late, later than one bit time on that bus. We're going to have whatever was left there before, and the late one is left in the dust. We have wrong data. The same thing can happen if one of them is early. It's going to be in the wrong byte, and we'll have wrong data. Did that help? Okay, you know, y'all, I keep pleading with you to ask questions. And we generally use parallel buses for short distances on the CPU and maybe on the motherboard. Serial buses transmit one bit at a time, so there's no opportunity for bus skew. And that's some good news. Um, one data line pair, that is a signal wire and a ground wire or return wire and maybe a few control lines. So instead of having eight wire pairs plus control lines, we've got one. Um, we can often get higher throughput with a serial bus because we have lower electrical interference and no chance for bus skew. So serial buses are our friend. Uh, and they're everywhere. Almost every one of you has something that plugs in to a universal serial bus with you. Um, the disk attachments inside of computers these days are serial. The serial ATA attachment bus. PCI Express is 
a kind of sort of serial parallel bus. And by kind of sort of, I mean I have a group of serial buses. Okay, and we're going to call each serial bus a lane. Um, you can see lane labeled as one of those gold arrows on the diagram. Um, full duplex operation means that the bus can transfer data in both directions simultaneously. And that works because there is a, there are two one-way paths, one for each direction. A one-way path is called a simplex path. Each pair of wires, each serial conductor is a lane, and I can combine lanes into links, but each lane transmits byte streams. So I would now have to be not a bit time out of timing, but an entire byte time out of timing. So I've got, I've got a, a much more relaxed timing constraint on the PCI Express bus. A point-to-point -point bus connects two devices. So we might have a point-to-point -point, point -point bus connecting the CPU to the PCI Express root complex device hub, if you will. Multi-point bus works like a network, more than one device on the same bus. So a network with two computers and a printer. The, the network conductors are a multi-point bus. In a modern CPU, we have the, the dotted line there shows the, the parts that are within the CPU chip package. That is that, that thing that you hold and it's the CPU. There's a, there are two chips at least in there. One of them is the CPU chip. The other one is the PCI Express root complex uh, hub, if you will, and it's connected to the CPU with a parallel bus. Then we use maybe all the lanes to connect the root complex to memory and all the lanes to connect to the graphic devices or device and some smaller number, some lower bandwidth connections to a PCI Express switch that can then um, connect to any number of PCI Express devices, USB bridge, and a serial ATA bridge. But the, the fundamental way of moving data around in a modern CPU is this PCI Express. A virtual memory solves the problem of the, the state where we have a program or a collection of programs that needs more memory than the computer has installed. And the solution, the way we deal with that is we use disk as a substitute for memory. Um, memory is much slower than the CPU, maybe 50 times slower, and disk is many times, like hundreds or thousands of times, slower than main memory. Virtual memory is managed by the operating system and built into the hardware. We need some cooperation from the hardware. It is independent of the application. That is, the programmer does not have to care whether a program will run on a machine with virtual memory. And the word we use for that is transparent. The programmer can't see it. Uh, memory is very slow compared to the CPU. If you think about a 2 gigahertz CPU, which is a little bit slow today, but it makes the math work out, um, we get one CPU cycle in half a billionth of a second. If you have 20 nanoseconds dynamic RAM, you get one access in 20 billionths of a second. So that memory is 40 times slower than the CPU. Now these days we have a CPU that's maybe 4 gigahertz and that makes memory 80 times slower because the speed increases of memory have not kept up with the speed increases of CPUs. So how can we improve memory access? Well, we can transfer 64 bits at a time instead of 32, uh, multiple bytes instead of one or two or four bytes at a time. We can do this thing called memory interleaving. Instead of having a single memory address register and memory data register, I have 
several of them, one for, one for each of several blocks of memory. And that means I can have more than one memory operation going on at the same time. And cache memory is the big deal. And here's a picture of memory interleaving. As you can see, we have four banks of memory, and each one has its own memory address register in orange and its own memory data register in blue. So address zero is in that first one. Address one is in the second one. So if those addresses are 64-bit words, we get 64 bits, then another 64, then another, then another. And I can do four memory accesses at a time. Uh, but the, the CPU and the operating system now have to deal with four memory address registers and four memory data registers. And I still only have one address bus and one data bus. So there's some complexity in there. No free lunches anywhere. Cache memory is small and fast memory that goes between the CPU and main memory. And we can have more than one layer of cache memory. We transfer blocks, and the blocks are small, um, for you know maybe 8 bytes or 16 bytes between main memory and cache memory. The size of that block is also called a cache line. The cache itself tells where in main memory the contents of each cache line came from. So if I've got this 16 bytes, I need to know where in main memory it came from. And cache tags provide that information. The hit ratio of a cache is the ratio of hits out of total requests, and it is not uncommon to have hit ratios of 90%. That is, 90% of the time, I'm going to get data out of the cache rather than having to go to that 40 or 80 times slower main memory. Now, there are some problems synchronizing cache and memory, and the biggest of those problems happens when there is a write to a memory location. The write to a memory location has to go through the cache, and there are two ways to do that. The write through design writes to the cache, but then immediately also writes to that 40 or 80 times slower uh, main memory. So write through tends to limit performance. Write back doesn't write from the cache to main memory until the cache line is about to be evicted until we're done with that cache. Write through, although the performance is slower, simplifies the design of the computer because now the designer can assume that main memory is always up to date. And you can't assume that with a write back cache. So once again, no such thing as a free lunch. Um, we take a performance hit for a simpler design or we get performance, but we have a more complex design. So if there is a cache hit, that is the cache contains the memory address that we're looking for, uh, first of all, all memory requests go through the cache controller. And in this case, we're asking for memory address 2351. The tags in the cache controller say, yes, indeed, I have some number of bytes that came from address 2351, and the cache memory immediately returns that data back to the CPU. And we can do that within a couple of CPU cycles. Um, if there is a cache miss, a couple of things have to happen. First, um, after the computer has been running more than a couple of milliseconds, the cache will be full. So we first have to have to empty a line in the cache. And if that line has been modified, we set a modified bit. And now we know that we, if we're doing write back, we have to write the contents of that line back to main memory. Then we can go read from main memory the data that the CPU requested. It goes into the cache and also gets sent back to the CPU. So a cache miss is kind of a hit as far as speed goes. 
I've already said that hit ratios of 90% or even more are common. Um, we can get not a 90% not a speed improvement, but maybe a 50% speed improvement. And the reason for that is this thing called locality of reference. And <clears throat> that happens, um, it's, it is part of the nature of the von Neumann architecture. So if you think about it for a minute, in a well-written program, you have small loops, right? So all the code in a loop is going to end up in the cache memory the first time you go through the loop. And the second time you go through the loop, all the code's in the cache memory. The other thing is that data tend to organize. Um, if you have a lot of similar data, you're going to put the data in an array, and the array or the part of it you're working on can be cached. Compilers collect the data, um, the non-array data, so that it's all at close by addresses as well. And that means that both data and code can be cached effectively and efficiently. This is a good thing. Now, programmers do not normally sit down and say, I need to put some locality of reference into this program. Normally, you just go ahead and write programs. Now, can you defeat locality of reference and write a hideously inefficient program? Sure, store stuff in an array row-wise and then access it column-wise. So it's not no longer chunks that are, are physically close together. So yes, you can defeat locality of reference, but normally you just don't worry about it. It is common to have three levels of cache these days. Um, on the CPU chip, the L1 cache might be a couple of megabytes. And then within the CPU chip package, in that same same hunk with pins on the bottom of it, you'd have an L2 cache that might be several megabytes, and then an L3 cache that is even more megabytes outside the chip package between memory and the chip package. Levels more than about three, the performance gain kind of rolls off and nobody bothers with a level four cache. Caching speeds up access, virtual memory increases the amount of perceived memory. So two different ways of managing memory with different purposes. Caching speeds up access, virtual memory get, increases the amount of perceived storage. The amount of real storage is, is still what it was, but now programmers need to worry less about that. <clears throat>